first hymn is a hymn that the praise team wants to sing with you. So if you would take your hymn, let's turn to hymn number 555. There won't be any words on the screen. But 555 is the song we'd like to sing with you. Would you please stand as we're singing together? somebody by this time would have wrote, written a song to put in a hymn book about mothers, but they haven't yet. This has got one verse it's about mothers, but we're going to sing all four. So if you would, would you please stand once again as we sing all four verses of 653. <laughs> Oh. 
Continue with our worship, with our giving of tithes and offerings. As our ushers come forward, we remember that you know this, these tithes and offerings. This is all part of our worship. We're honoring God for what He's given us, and we're praying that He uses this to further His kingdom. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. O grace and Father, Lord, we pray that you are glorified by these praises we have sung. Lord, right now, as we collect this tithes and offerings, Lord, we pray that you are glorified once again in our trust of you to bless us as we give to this church. Lord, we pray that you use these funds to further your kingdom work here in Kevel and in our surrounding areas, Lord. We pray once again, Lord, that you are glorified by everything that we do. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. It's not a, about mothers. It's a, a song that mothers might would sing to their children. So, uh, in my eyes.
to their children and generations to come. You know, as we get into God's Word today, as we look at this topic of, you know, building a legacy of faith, it's the mothers who did it definitely, but the rest of us can learn that we need to also be focusing on that legacy of faith that we're called to pass down. It's not just, you know, for our own children and for their children, but it's for our community as well as we build this legacy of faith. You know, I've been here for about two months now, and I can already see how busy our ladies are at this church building this legacy of faith. The WMU, they're not letting the grass grow underneath their feet. They're always going. They're always doing something. And for that, I applaud y'all. I love what y'all are doing here for the missions of our community and globally. We've got sign-up sheets for VBS, and I've been working with Sarah to put those together, you know, put VBS together. And I love hearing the stories of what our ladies are doing, not just for their children, but for the children of the community as we're getting ready for this vacation Bible school. It's all about getting that legacy built and passing it on to the next generation. And we as husbands and children, we need to learn from this too. This is something that we need to be focused on as well. And what we're going to talk about today is for all of us, not just the mothers. We all need to work on building this legacy of faith. And before we get God's word, let's talk about this. This legacy of faith, it's not easy. It's not easy to build this legacy, legacy of faith with so much that's being thrown at us as individuals. <clears throat> we have the busyness of life. There's so much to be done. There's work that we've got to do. There's bills that have to be paid. There's children that we've got to keep alive. There's houses that are, that are mothers and even some of those guys here that we work to keep in order. 
There always seems to be urgent things that distract us from the important things. And we gotta remember what's urgent and what's important. I love this quote from President Eisenhower back in 1954. He said, I have two kinds of problems, the urgent and the important. The urgent are not important and the important are never urgent. And people smarter than me, they've taken this Eisenhower principle and they've used this to kind of help us figure out what's urgent, what's important. And it defines those things as being urgent as urgent activities demand immediate attention and are usually associated with achieving someone else's goals. Those urgent things, that's the busyness of life. That's the thing that tries to steal our attention and distract us from what our goals are. Yes, it's important to go to work. It's important to earn a paycheck. It's important to pay bills. But when we boil it down, some of those things don't really help us with what are, what's important to us, our life mission. They need to be there. They are urgent, but they're not important. With this principle, they also they say that what's important is what benefits our goals, what we want from our life, what that, and essentially this legacy that we want to leave. The important things are what shape how we want to be known, what we want to achieve in our own lives for ourselves. With this principle and dealing with this busyness of life, we need to determine what our goals are, what we want to achieve. As believers, followers of Christ, one of our goals should be building that legacy that affects our children, our community, and the generations to come. You know, that means we find ways to use this busyness of life. Because like I said, earning the paycheck's important, paying the bills is important. Naturally, of course, keeping kids alive is important. But we need to see how doing those activities, we can point others back to God and build that legacy that we're being led to build, this legacy of faith. We've also got the burdens of this world. This isn't the busyness of life. This is the things that the society tries to put upon us. And this is the struggles that society puts upon us and our faith due to their views. And I would say in our society right now, our women, our mothers, definitely have this burden put upon them. Our society is trying to redefine, and they're doing a poor job at it, what a woman really is. Right now, our society is trying to say, to boil down your motherhood, your womanhood, down to a feeling, an emotion. And they're, in a way, it's also coming down to an attack on womanhood. It's an attack on motherhood, saying that as mothers, you should be able to be everything your entire family needs. There's no need for a husband. There's no need for a man. And if you're in that situation, I'm sorry, you know, the Bible says that it is much better for you, know, the father and the mother, to be working there together. And society is putting this struggle on us. It's saying that, women, you can go and you can do whatever you want, and yes, you can go do whatever you want. But don't get me wrong, there's more than just, you know, our careers. There's more than just what we do. It's that family option. And I feel like sometimes our society puts such an emphasis on that that women, you've got to go be your self-made person that they don't take into consideration that some ladies, some mothers want to be mothers. And you should never be made to feel less than that because of the decision the priority you made for yourself. Our society gives us these burdens sometimes that make leaving a legacy of faith more difficult than it should be. And then we also have to deal with the discouragement that comes with building that legacy of faith. And not just mothers, I'm sure fathers, you're going to get this with me too. Sometimes when we hit that certain age, we're you know, our kids can be a discouragement from us trying to build this legacy of faith that we hope to do. 
And I'm not saying kids are bad. We love kids. Kids are good. Teens are good. But there's something that happens to these adolescent teenage minds. And this is not an insult toward anybody because this, once again, is fact. You know, as little children, our kids look up to us. They want to honor us. They want to do what we say. And then as they, re, you know, when they hit teenage, young adult years, their brains, as they're forming, they hit this new level of development that they are trying to figure things out for themselves. They're seeking out different sources of knowledge other than just mom and dad. And it is not a bad thing. That's what we want them to do. That's part of growing up. We want them to learn to think for themselves and weigh out these ideologies and thought processes. But then we begin to realize that sometimes they begin to think of themselves as smarter than their primary instructors. I know I'm guilty of this. You know, I hit that age to where mom and dad weren't as smart as I thought they were. And I probably did a lot of awful things as a teenager growing up. And I'm not going to confess them all to you now, but, you know, anybody who's ever prayed for my parents, thank you. And then about age 25, our brains become fully developed. And then we begin to realize mom and dad now are suddenly a lot smarter than what we thought they were. And we begin getting that. We begin honoring them once again. We begin, begin appreciating their wisdom, hopefully anyway. In the meantime, for anybody struggling with that, building this legacy, I know it hurts when you feel rejected from those you were trying to pass this legacy down to. And thank you for continuing to do that anyway. You know, as we look at Scripture to see what the Scripture says about mothers and living this, leaving this legacy, the Bible only gives us a few handfuls of snapshots of what mothers do as far as passing down this legacy of faith. And as we look at this, none of these mothers are perfect. They are human. They make mistakes. But we can still learn from them along the way. So the mothers we're going to look at today is in 2 Timothy, verses 1 through 5. These mothers and grandmothers that we're going to look at, they're only mentioned in one verse in the entire scripture. That's all they get is just one verse. But let's look and see what we can learn from these mothers in this brief little mention we get of them. So follow along with me, 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by God's will, for the sake of the promise of life in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly loved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve with a clear conscience, as my ancestors did, when I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day. Remembering your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I recall your sincere faith that first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and now I'm convinced is in you also. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. May your souls be nourished by that. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can open your word, turn to your word, and learn from your word. Right now, Lord, as we dig deep into your word, I pray that once again, your spirit speaks through me. Let your people hear your voice, not mine. And let your words convict us of what we need to do. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. So, let's set the context for this letter of 2 Timothy. As we see right there in the passage we just read, it was written by Paul. Paul had this amazing upbringing in the faith. Due to the legacy builders in his life, Paul had reasons to boast. Philippians chapter 3, verses 5 through 6, Paul writes this about himself. He says, circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, regarding the law of Pharisee, regarding zeal persecuting the church, regarding the righteousness that is in the law, blameless. 
Due to his upbringing, due to his, you know, how he was raised, Paul had reasons to boast. He had reasons to boast in the religious legacy that he had been given. He had the best teachers. He had the best, you know, parents who made sure that he had the education that he needed. And he had all of that given to him. He was both, he could boast in that stuff. But then Paul is given a different legacy, the one that we're more familiar with. He has this life-changing encounter with Jesus Christ, and Christ gives him a new legacy to live out and pass down. So today we can recognize Paul has the one of the first and probably one of the greatest missionaries to ever live. And I can say that because over 2,000 years later, well, about 2,000 years later, we're reading Paul's words right now. The legacy that he has passed down, we have, it's the majority of what we call the New Testament. But as we look at this, his legacy wasn't built upon himself. His legacy was built upon what Christ had told him to do. And he even tells us that. Follow me, mimic me, his I mimic Christ. We see that this letter was written to Timothy. And Timothy was one of the recipients of that legacy that Paul was building. Paul, who was never married, never had family, but as we hear right here, to Timothy, my dearly loved son. He accepted Timothy as his own son in the faith. Timothy was trained and he received the legacy from Paul to pass down to others. Specifically, the church in Ephesus for which Paul had left Timothy behind to pastor that church. As we look at the context of when Paul's writing this to Timothy, this is the end of Paul's life. Paul is in prison and he knows that it's over. His time, to, you know, his life is coming to an end. He will soon be executed for his faith and the legacy that he's been building. It's reflected in most of this letter that Paul's writing here. And even in light of his impending death, he's still writing this letter to my dearly loved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As Paul's writing this letter about spreading this legacy of faith, Paul says, Timothy, I realize that it's not just me, it's others have poured into you. The faith that you are exhibiting, I have seen from your grandmother, Lois, and from your mother, Eunice, and I see that it's been passed down to you. We see that this faith has been a contagious faith. Lois passed it down to her daughter, Eunice. Eunice Pass it down to Timothy, and Timothy is passing this legacy of faith to the church that he pastors. Based on the way that Lois, Eunice, and Timothy were living, this faith, the way they were living their faith out, it became contagious. Now, just to clarify, when I'm talking about a contagious faith, I'm talking about us living out a faith in front of others that they can see that there's something different. And they're drawn to it. Their faith spread to each generation due to the way they lived it out. But our faith will never save anybody else. Our decision to make Jesus Lord and Savior of our life will never save anybody else. It can point them to it, and I hope our faith does point others to Christ. But it's their decision to follow Jesus that will save them. Each one is responsible for their own faith. It cannot be inherited. It. You can't say because my grandfather was a pastor, I'm safe. No. Your faith has to come from yourself. It has to be your relationship with Jesus. But we can lay that foundation of faith for others to accept it as their own faith. And this starts by building your faith. 
If you don't have faith, then you can't lay that foundation of faith for anybody else. This reminds me of every time that I've gone into an airplane and they're given this safety speech. And they say that in the case of an emergency, face masks will drop, air, you know, airbags will be there, and they'll tell you before you take care of anybody else, you gotta take care of yourself. And the same is true about our faith. Before we can lay a foundation of faith for anybody else, we've got to build our own faith. It starts by putting your faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. It's about understanding what the Bible has to say about this. We were made for that relationship with God. That's why we were created. But we have this tendency to say, I want to do things my own way as if I know better. And God, you know, you just sit back. I can figure this life out. And I don't need you. When we do that, that's called sin. When we reject God, reject the relationship, we separate ourselves from God because of our sin. It's based on our own actions, not nothing nobody else has ever done. And then once we realize that we've sinned and we've messed up, we have this tendency to say, I can take care of this. I can try to handle this on my own. But we can't. And when we try to clean up our own mess, we just make it even worse. We can't clean up our own mess because we can't afford the price of cleaning up our own mess. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot pay for our own sins. But due to his great love for us, Jesus died for our sins, and he took our place upon that cross that was meant for us, and he rose from the grave to show that death has no more power, that he can't overcome. When we put our faith and trust in him for the forgiveness of our sins, we are brought back into that relationship. That foundation of faith is laid, and we can now build our faith upon that. We are restored to God. It's a life that we get to enjoy now. We begin building that foundation of faith now, not just waiting for, it, for heaven. Yeah, this foundation of faith, it does last for an eternity, but we enjoy it now. Once we get that foundation of faith, once we put our faith and trust in Jesus, and we begin building that faith, we begin you know, following Jesus deeper and deeper. We never stop learning. We never stop growing in our faith. If we hit a point where we say, I've gone far enough, there's nothing else for me to learn, then we need to have our eyes open and realize we still got more to learn about this infinite God who loves us. We'll never stop growing in that faith. We do that by spending time in his word, by spending time in prayer, getting to know our God better, and we allow our God to transform us into what he wants us to be. And then when we get to that point that we are building our own faith, we let that spread to those around us so they can see that something is different and we share this legacy of faith. This legacy of faith, this contagious faith, is lived out in our actions. Not just with words, but we show people what we believe by the way we live our lives. This is one of the problems that Jesus had with the Pharisees that we talked about last week when we, met, when we looked at Matthew 22. As Jesus was talking to and teaching all the people, there's one thing that he said about the Pharisees. He said, look at what these leaders are teaching. Listen to them. He said, but don't do what they do. Because they don't do what they teach themselves, what they're trying to teach themselves to do. He said, listen to them, but don't do what they do, because their lives don't match up with what their words say. Our actions will really show what we believe more than our words will. You see, words can be shaped. We can sit down, we can write a speech, we can think about what I'm going to say in this particular situation, and we can have it all planned out, and it can sound all nice. But our faith is really made evident when we have to face some of those situations that we can't plan on. 
You can look at how you know someone's face. You know, look at someone's face. You can look at how they spend their time, and that is really going to show you what they believe. How do they handle those situations that come up that nobody plans on? That is where you see their faith lived out. Live out your faith in your actions. And let your actions shape the legacy of faith that you want others to catch from you. But don't forget your words. Now, I might sound like I'm contradicting myself, but our legacy of faith is taught in words. It's lived out for others to see, and then it is talked about. We discuss it. Our legacy of faith will not be contagious if we're not teaching it verbally to others. One of my favorite Bible verses is Matthew 5, 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. This verse is saying that both our actions and our words are necessary when it comes to living out our faith around others. Yes, we do the good things, we show others, but then we tell them, the reason I'm doing this is because Jesus loved me and I love you the way Jesus loves you. We point others back to Christ and give him the glory for everything that we do. The good deeds that we do, the things that we do to show others Jesus, it's not a means of us earning our salvation. We don't do it to receive salvation. But it's a way of saying, God, because you love me, I love you, and I'm going to do what you want me to do. Our actions also show others we love them, too, as we seek out, seek out ways to serve them. But we need words, too. We need to tell people the reason why we do what we do, and it's all about Jesus. If we just did good works, but then never spoke the name of Christ, we're just good people. That's all it is. It's, you know, people can assume we're just good people. We love helping other people out. But then if we do that, if we don't share the name of Jesus, we're ignoring the most important thing that they need. We would be serving them right as they walk along their way to hell. That message of Jesus is needed so that their biggest need that they have is taken care of. Our actions get their attention our words inform them of why we're doing what we do. As we seek to build a legacy of faith, we need to teach that faith to others. We raise up new believers and teach them to do the things that God's commanded us to do. We need our actions and we need our words. As we grow in this faith, we've also got to share the wisdom. The wisdom that we gain comes from God. And this faith is spread through sharing that wisdom to others as well. Proverbs 1 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Now, just to clarify, there is a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is information. We go to school, we get knowledge. We read a newspaper, we get knowledge. We have access to knowledge, to all kinds of knowledge. 24-7 at our fingertips when we pull out our phone and we go to Google and we can search for whatever we want. Knowledge is so easily available that anybody can have knowledge. I even heard about one guy who was talking about this, that he would go to Instagram or TikTok and actually looking for recipes, he would rather watch people film videos about cooking than he would to go to a website and read a long list of ingredients to put into something. We have more access to knowledge than ever before. We can find it anywhere, in any source, written, typed, on a screen, videos, pictures, whatever. But wisdom is how we use that knowledge. Wisdom is knowledge put to use. And that's not as common. There are many people who have knowledge of various things. There are many people who have knowledge even of the Bible. We have people who have 
read through scripture and they don't have the wisdom that comes from this. They have knowledge of it, but they don't have the wisdom that comes with it. They haven't put that knowledge to use in their lives. They can even use the Bible to argue as to why they don't believe in God, but that just shows a partial understanding of what we believe, and it doesn't make them wise. Wisdom is how we put knowledge to use. Spiritual wisdom is putting the Bible's message to work in our lives. It's fearing God and allowing that relationship with God to shape how we live our lives. It's about realizing the truth of who we are and what we have done and what our Savior has done for us and allowing God's perfect love to draw us closer to Him. We can gain knowledge from the author of life and then we get wisdom when we put this into practice. Proverbs 22, 6. It says, start a youth out on his way. Even when he grows old, he will not depart from it. As we get this wisdom, we pass it down to those that we're seeking to live this legacy of faith for. We teach it, we live it out to those around us. You know that passage of Proverbs 22, 6? Start a youth out on his way. Even when he grows old, he will not depart from it. That shows us that his parents, we pour this biblical wisdom into our children and have them begin building this foundation of faith so that even if they hit a point where they walk away from it, hopefully they come back to it as adults. Now the thing is, as Solomon writes this to us, this isn't a guarantee that our children will always come back to that. But as we look at this, we realize that if we don't do this, they definitely won't come back to that faith. You know, even today, we see more and more believers, people who have said they were Christians, walking away from the faith. And there's no guarantee that they're ever going to come back to it. But that isn't a reason for us to stop believing this legacy of faith. This isn't a reason for us to stop trying. Even if they walk away from it for a time, we continue to pray for them that they come back to that foundation of faith that we lay for them. But if they have no foundation for faith, then that prayer, you know, what are we even trying to do with it anymore? We guide them to the faith and we continue to pray for them and that they continue in the faith even when they reach adulthood. Now, like I said earlier, you know, there's the time sometimes that his mothers, his fathers, we might start to wonder, are they even getting this? Are they even understanding what I'm saying? And I promise you, they are. Our kids are sharp. Our kids understand this stuff. They get it. Even though they, it might not seem like it at a time, they understand it. Your wisdom will be remembered. And hopefully... Our children are passing down to their children who pass down to their children and they'll continue for generations. And I got some proof that you know we have a biblical example of this. At the very end of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 31, the very last chapter of it, we see that this is no longer written by Solomon. This is the words of King Lemuel. And if I'm pronouncing that wrong, I'm sorry, but if you can tell me how to pronounce it, let me know. Because I definitely want to learn how to pronounce that right. Now the thing that, you know, this to read that first verse again, this is the words of King Lemuel, a pronouncement that his mother taught him. We have no idea who King Lemuel is. He is not listed anywhere else in Scripture. He is not listed in the kings of Israel, the kings of Judah, or anything like that. He has no other book in the Bible. He has just this one little chapter right here. And you see what he's saying there? This is the king's pronouncement based on what his mom taught him. These are not his words. This is what mom taught him. And thousands of years later, we still look at the words of King Lemuel's mother and we gain from her wisdom. 
I would almost bet there was a time when King Lemuel's mom was like, I don't know if Lemuel's getting it or not. But at this point, he says, I got it, mom. And I'm sure if she was still alive, this part of his kingly reign, she was probably proud of him at this moment. Being able to repeat back her words. And what words does she give? Avoid wine and women, seek justice, and marry a good woman of noble character. So, guys in the room, young men, what's learned from King Mule's wife? Avoid wine, avoid certain women, and find a good wife to marry. Seek justice and do what is right. You see, so much about our wisdom or legacy faith is not just about, you know, yes. The key to it is, is Jesus dying for our sins, giving us new life. But we've also got to teach them how this new life is supposed to look. We keep passing down the godly wisdom of this is how we're to live, and we teach them how to do it. King Mule's mom, his, she was wise. We need to listen to her. Guys, listen. Kids, listen to your mom so you know what they're talking about. Moms, keep passing down that godly wisdom. You might wonder if they're hearing it. They are. And hopefully, when they need it most, they come back to it. And the third point today in this leaving, you know, creating this legacy of faith is persevere. Whatever you do, don't give up. Even when things aren't going your way and you question if you're making a difference or not, don't give up. Keep persevering toward the goal of this legacy of faith. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. He says, Therefore, since we have this ministry because we were shown mercy, we do not give up. Instead, we have renounced secret and shameful things, not acting deceitfully or distorting the word of God, but committing ourselves before God to everyone's conscience by an open display of the truth. But if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel and the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we are not proclaiming ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of knowledge to God, of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. Since we have this ministry because we were shown mercy, we do not give up. Others see your faith. When you are living your faith out in front of others, they see it, I promise. The world is watching you. They want to know if this Jesus is really making a difference in your life. Because if they can't see that it does, why would they spend their time? Why would they waste their precious time on something that's not working? Live the life of faith, no matter how hard it gets. Live the life of faith. Build the legacy of faith that draws others to Jesus. Do not give up. Persevere in your faith. I promise it will make a difference in, in the long run as long as you don't give up. Fight the fight of faith. This legacy of faith is not easy to build, but it's worth it. Mothers, fathers, teachers, believers, keep pouring into this new generation. Keep pouring into those around you who need to hear this. Set the example for those around you. And as moms do this, we got to remember all of us are called to do this. We all need to be focused on building this legacy of faith for those coming behind us. So as we come to this time of invitation, where are you at in your faith? If you put your faith and trust in Jesus, if you built that foundation, if you haven't, during this time of invitation, if you're ready to make Jesus Lord and Savior, I'm up here, I want to pray with you. I want to walk you through that decision that you can build that foundation. If you've 
build that foundation of faith, we still got struggles. We're never promised that everything will be perfect and easy. There's still stuff that we struggle with. You need to come up here. The altar is open for prayer. Whatever we're going through, God's here. Come use the time of prayer. You want me to pray with you? I'll pray with you. But come up and see, you know, talk to God and find out what he's wanting from you. Give your burdens to him and let him take them. This time is time between you and God, not between you and anybody else. Don't worry about what anybody says. This is your time to get right with God and do what God's calling you to do. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. The grace of Father, Lord, we thank you for everything that you've given us. We thank you for this faith that we can have built upon your foundation. And Lord, I pray for these legacy builders here in this room, the moms that we're honoring today, the teachers, the fathers, the parents, the grandparents, as we build this legacy of faith. I pray that you give us the courage to do it. No matter how hard it gets, no matter how difficult things are, Continue giving us the courage to go forth and build this legacy of faith that you've given us. Lord, I pray that if there's any in this room who have not professed you as Lord and Savior, that today is the day of salvation for them. That they turn from their sins and turn to you and find the forgiveness from their sins. Not by their own strength, but by your grace and your love and your mercy. Lord, move in our hearts here today and do a mighty work so that we can do stuff that honors and glorifies you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen.